Hi, everyone. This is Rafi. I'm here with my friend Shaban Huggins from cholesterolcode.com and other explorations in immunology and metabolism. So hi, Shaban. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Hi, Rafi. Thanks for inviting me. I was very excited when you <laughs> first asked. I was like, ooh, Rafi asked me. Be jealous or Thank everyone you. else. That's, that's flattering. That's flattering. Um, so that's a very good way to start the podcast with, with flattering. <laughs> yeah, just good, lots uh, of flattering. Exactly. And so I, I send you a list of topics I would like to hit today. And the first one is, I guess, a good way to introduce you as well, because you po you posted about your story on, on Twitter. And it sort of concludes with an interesting, shall we say, diagnosis um, uh, for you to, to explore now. So I'd love for you to give us that story and then that talk about that diagnosis and what it means and all of that. Yeah, for sure. So pretty much all of my life since I was about nine, 10, I've struggled with my health. That's when I started gaining weight. It's when I started getting chronic depression symptoms. Um, later on, I ended up developing chronic joint pain and back pain and just a whole bunch of not very nice things. I also had skin problems like eczema and dandruff and just overall garbage. <laughs> Didn't feel well at all day to day. It was very bad. Um, and by the time I was 18, I was obese and hypertensive and my doctor was super angry at me was the impression I got. Um, and I weighed 240 pounds at the time. So I think that's over a hundred kilos, I guess. And I'm five, two. So that's a lot on me. <laughs> I took up a fair amount of space. Um, and like I said, I just didn't feel well. And the doctor at the time I had talk to him about, you know, the high cholesterol part and the high blood pressure part and my weight. And I had said that I wanted to try diet and exercise, which I had done before uh, and it hadn't worked, but, you know, it was the only thing I'd ever heard of as an option. And he basically said, you can eat grass and drink water and your cholesterol is not going to change. You should just go on medication, et cetera, et cetera. So after that, um, I didn't have a good relationship with him at all. And shortly after that, I fired him and never went back because it's like, well, this isn't helping. Um, and I did focus on calorie restriction during that time for the next couple of years. Uh, I would go from 1500 calories to 1200 calories. At one point I was trying to do 800, but the problem was every single time I tried to do that, like, sure, I'd lose a little bit of weight, but I'd also be extremely hungry. And calorie restricting was actually making my depression symptoms worse. And it's like, okay, so is this the trade-off that I kind of have to battle is just be hungry all the time and even more depressed than I already am. And the calorie restriction at that time was also triggering mood swings, which my boyfriend didn't appreciate <laughs> either. He was very tolerant, but I felt bad for him. And eventually in 2016, I went into my mom's office and I was like, I'm going to try calorie restricting again because it's worked so well the million other times I've tried it. She was like, actually, instead of doing that, uh, I've been looking into this ketogenic diet thing and I think we should do it together because she had also struggled with weight pretty much her whole life. She tried a million things, none of it worked, all that type of stuff. And my mom is not stupid. She's one of the smartest people I know. So even though I was like, oh, this seems kind of like a fad diet thing, I decided to look a little bit more into it and make my opinion after that. And after looking into it a little bit, I was like, oh, there may actually be some science behind this. So I guess the only way to figure out if it's going to work is just try it really strict for two months, no cheating at all. Just do it and see what happens. And if it works, then this is going to have to be a lifestyle because if I do what I've been doing before, it's just going to go back to where I was at. And after those two months of a strict ketogenic diet, I had lost 20 pounds, which was probably the biggest weight loss I'd seen ever without hunger. Um, and at the two month mark, I also realized that my chronic depression was in complete asymptomatic remission. I was like, oh, I'm contented and happy with my life. And yeah, like I'm still obese at this point, but wow, what a great family I have, what great friends I have. And finally, just like being able to appreciate things and not seeing the bad in every single thing, including myself. And 
honestly, during the beginning, it was very scary for me because I saw this improvement and immediately I was like, it's going to stop working any day now. And it's going to stop working. I'm going to gain it all back. The depression is going to come back. And I even had a serious talk with my boyfriend at the time. I was like, look, if like, I know this is a good thing for me to be getting healthier, but I'm really concerned it's not going to work anymore. And I'm going to gain all the weight back. And by that point, you'll have seen me at a lower weight and then I'll be at a higher weight. Like (laughs) just be aware. And he was like, I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you looked like before you started the diet. I'm not going to care after think you're beautiful no matter what. So don't worry about it. The thing that I'm concerned about is this seems to be making you happy. So I think you should keep doing it. Even if you stop losing weight, it's like, okay. (laughs) So I kept going and now I am about 80 pounds down um and no depression for the time i've been on a ketogenic diet uh i have had some slight symptoms come back when i did a high carb experiment for about two months afterwards the experiment itself was eight days long and then in the two months after i was much more pessimistic social anxiety lots of fallout from that experiment i don't recommend Mm it (laughs) it sucked um (laughs) so what what were you reintroducing in that experiment So with the high carb experiment, I was attempting to replicate an experiment that my colleague Dave had done where he had done uh, lean, lean processed meat and white bread to bring his cholesterol down really far. And (laughs) he didn't feel good from that either. And for me personally, it was like, I need to tailor this to be a little bit more safe for me because with any experiment, safety is always priority number one. And that includes mental health. So I actually picked uh, black beans, lean chicken breast, uh, cumin, I think like powdered garlic or something like that. I have to recheck. And then I did that for, I think, three days. And then after that, I added bananas and honey. And the second part was um, 3,200 calories instead of 1,700. So I doubled it. And yeah, that didn't go well. (laughs) What were the macros? Uh, I think it was like 15 or 20% protein and then the rest carbs and negligible fat. Like I didn't even have water. It was like super high carb, super high carb. Yeah. Um, and my LDL went down a little bit, but not a lot. And it was only afterwards that it came to one of the Facebook groups that we run. People were like, Oh, fructose has this particular thing where it can increase LDL, even though it's high carb. It's like, oh, cool. So that second phase experiment probably didn't work because I had the honey and the banana. Um, Mm. So if I were to redo it, which I'm not going to, I would probably do something like sweet potato or something like that. That's just starch. Gotcha. So do do you think uh, the immunological uh, profile of beans could have been a, a factor in that or, or not? Yeah, I don't know if it was the specific carb exactly because I've had temporary reactions to like accidentally getting honey butter instead of regular butter at a restaurant or flour or like all this stuff. And I seem to react regardless. And for me, I think it's in the health context that I'm in. I'm just sensitive to carbs in general. Mm. Um, So for me, like I'm much healthier than I used to be. I'm no longer hypertensive. I've lost 80 pounds. My skin is much better, like all this type of stuff. But at the same time, I recently got a diagnosis. That's like, you're not super 100% guaranteed healthy all the way through. And I think that's contributing to how sensitive I am to different things. And then Mm -hmm. also just my past history with health and how much I've struggled with it. Uh, high carb is not, (laughs) it doesn't work for me. I don't think it's just not a good fit. Um, so yeah, with the Mm -hmm. recent diagnosis I had done in another experiment where I had done two weeks of water fasting, and then I did a week of fat only feeding. So all the calories were coming from fat and it was not even a lot. It was like 410 calories per day, but that was eating ad libitum. And it was just so satiating. I couldn't eat more than that after the fast. Uh, and I lost weight from it. I don't remember exactly how much, but I mean, my waist went down like two inches or something. My weight went down to like 136 pounds, something like that. But people pointed out on social media, not unkindly, 
that my legs and my arms were still big. And looking over the data myself, my arms, like my measurements and the arms had only gone down a quarter of an inch over that entire time, which is really weird considering how mm. much I lost off of my waist. And I lost a fair amount off of my legs too, but my arms have always been really stubborn when it comes to weight loss. And mm -hmm. I figured it was, I don't know, maybe they're just going to come off last or I'm doing something wrong or something like that. But people actually reached out to me and asked privately, do you think or have you ever considered that you might have lipedema? I was like, what's lipedema? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um, so I ended up looking into it and it's a fat storage disorder or a loose connective tissue disorder. Um, and basically what happens is you have fluid accumulation in certain areas, typically below the waist. And in a lot of the times the upper arms are involved as well. And this fluid accumulation ends up encouraging fat growth in those areas. And there's some people who think that it's a general connective tissue disorder at its root. So the fat isn't being held in proper place. And then you can have hypoxia and not enough nutrients getting to those areas. And then you get fun things like fibrosis, which is basically scarring. And so you get scarred fat tissue and then you can't get anything out of it again. So you get this fat accumulation and then the fat scars and then you're stuck with it pretty much. And that's basically what I've been experiencing as far as I can tell. And uh, this Wednesday, I actually went to a specialist, a lipedema specialist, and she poked and prodded and asked a bunch of questions and was like, yep, you sure do have lipedema. So <laughs> that was very okay. interesting in part because I was the typical obese person before I went keto and it was only after keto that it started standing out that, oh, I'm actually disproportionate. So it's kind of like I had the lipedema limb profile of the disproportionate limbs, but then I also had abdominal obesity. Like I've lost, I think 10 inches off of my waist in total from keto. Wow but my arms have only lost a couple inches off of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the two things stacked on top of each other and one was hiding the other one where if I had never lost that weight, I probably would never have known that I had it. Right. Um, and with lipidema, That's so it's kind interesting. Of, yeah, it's kind of tricky. It's actually really common. It's like thought to be around one in nine Caucasian women has lipidema. And so it's like, okay, that's really prevalent. And then the first thing is like, it's a genetic disorder. And it's like, but wait, <laughs> right? like one in nine women have it, you're saying, but it's also genetic. I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. Like, mm -hmm. sure, it could be partially genetic, but it seems like environment is also impacting. And so now I've had the opportunity since it was suggested that I might have it to reach out to a bunch of women with lipedema. And they're like, oh, keto actually really helps with my symptoms like the easy bruising and the tenderness and all that type of stuff. And I've experienced the exact same thing because I got to see that specialist and she was asking all these questions of like, do you have easy bruising? Do you have limb tenderness? Do you have all this type of stuff? And I, for a lot of things, I was able to say, you know, I used to, and then I went keto and now I don't, which at least for me seems to suggest that keto is also helping with the symptoms, which is massive because like with lipedema, you have compression gear that you can do. You can do deep tissue massage, but there's like, it's pretty much, we don't know what to do with you. And even my own doctor mm -hmm. said that like, sure, I could give you a referral to get diagnosed with lipedema, but there's not really anything you can do about it. So why do you right. even want to bother? And it's like, yeah, so I'm on, stuck on a... and I, don't, I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> so on a scale of, of one to 10, how how severe would your case be? Do you, do you know, like, are there, is there like yeah, scale so or something? I actually got staged. So there are various stages involved. Um, and she said that I'm stage one, which is the lowest stage. So not very severe at all. Um, I scored very well on mobility and she said I had one of the lowest scores she had pretty much ever seen, which is good. And maybe part of that is my age. I'll just have to see over time if things get worse or not. Um, but mm -hmm. as far as I know, I've had no progression over the past five years, except for the high carb experiment, where I think my arms actually got bigger. After that, my jackets and stuff started fitting 
poorly gotcha. and it's like mm, good <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and do you think a uh, cac score will be particularly relevant to you because of the soft tissue aspect of this or 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 not so they actually recommend doing an echocardiogram um, because lipedema is thought to maybe just be associated with um, connective tissue disorders in general, like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and stuff like that. Um, I've actually already had one and what they're looking for in that is aortic dilation because the aorta is very connective tissue heavy. And if you don't have yeah. proper connective tissue, it kind of doesn't work right. right. Uh, luckily, I was all clear on that, but I'll be getting repeats over the years just to keep an eye on it. Uh, and she also recommended a DEXO, which I've also already had. And what they're looking for there is uh, bone density issues or bone formation issues. And I was all good. Yeah. I was actually in the 88th percentile for uh, bone density. So it's nice. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, and I have also had a CAC, uh, but it was just checking for in the heart as usual. Right. Um, and it was zero, but I was 23 at the time, I think, or 22, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, so I was just getting a baseline. I didn't expect to see anything. Yeah, no, that's super smart. I, I was thinking I'm 31 now. I should get a baseline. Um, mm -hmm. I, sh I should do that. So yeah, I'll, I'll put it on my to-do list. But yeah, so that's that's super interesting how the the amazing fat loss that you managed to, to sustain for this period of time. How, how long do you estimate it, it took you to lose that, that 80 pounds? Um, I mean, it's been a bit of a process <laughs> because <All right. laughs> it's not like I lost it all and then plateaued, right? Like I lost a fair amount of it. And then I lost a fair amount over the first year or so. And then in the end of 2017, so after that first year, I went carnivore and then I lost like another 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after that, I... Yeah, I kind of maintained it that weight. And then I did the high carb experiment and I gained 17 pounds that mm -hmm. wouldn't come off. And then I had to like figure out what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> and funnily enough, right before the high carb experiment, I had done a high fat carnivore experiment. And I had found that eating ad libitum comparing higher fat to higher protein. So my higher protein was about 30% then the rest fat. And with a uh, higher fat carnivore, it was about like 12, 15% protein and then the rest fat. Um, I actually lost weight with the higher fat. And so after the high carb experiment, I gained all this weight and it's like, okay, what do I do now? I went immediately back to high fat carnivore, but it was including dairy and I didn't lose any of the weight. And it stayed like that for a year. And it's like, this is dumb. <laughs> I hate this. Um, and of course, like me being you know, in the public eye, people of course commented like, oh, how can you say carnivore works when you're still fat? Like all this type of stuff. And fair enough, if you're coming from a place of you're considering trying carnivore and you're doing it for weight things and you see someone else who's not having success, it's fair to ask like, why is that? But it's not that carnivore didn't get me to a normal weight. It's that I did something dumb <laughs> and then <couldn laughs> get back from it. Um, right. But eventually for some reason, I was like, let's just try a high fat carnivore without dairy. I'll keep butter in because butter is good. I don't often hear people having issues with it. And then I started losing weight again. It's like, what, why? <laughs> because I love right. dairy. I love cheese of all kinds, but I've, yep. I spent like a year after that, like waffling on it. Like, oh, maybe goat cheese is okay. Oh, maybe raw dairy is okay. Oh, maybe this type is okay. Maybe this brand is okay. And really it's just tricking myself because I knew dairy was the issue, even if I don't know the specifics of why. And I just kept going back and forth. And so I maintained at the higher weight again, because I was including dairy. And finally about a month and change ago, like a month and a half, I was like, all right, no dairy, no dairy, no more of this. No, <laughs> I'm <Yes>. done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I'll keep butter in. I know that's fine. I know I can lose weight with butter. It's fine. And I'll stick to the high fat carnivore because I already know I do better with that. And yeah, I'm almost back to the weight I was at <laughs> before I did the high carb experiment. And then after that, my like stretch goal 
is to get to the weight I had gotten to after the high fat carnivore experiment the first time, because I did that. I got to my lowest recorded adult weight. And then I immediately went back to higher protein carnivore to gain it all back and get back to my previous baseline to do the high carb experiment. So right. it's like, just why? <laughs> These are the things I do to myself, but I learned a whole bunch over that yeah. amount of time. Um, and like with the high carb experiment, I had mood issues for two months after. And so now I can kind of warn people ahead of time, like, Hey, if you have this history going off and having a cheat day during the holidays might impact your mood, it might be something to look out for. Definitely not something mm -hmm. to dismiss. Um, so I think it was valuable that I did that. It just caused a bunch of issues for me that <laughs> made me very grumpy. Um, but yeah, so I'm almost back to that weight before I did that experiment. And my mood was also being impacted by dairy, not like to depressive levels, but just much more pessimistic, much less motivated. Mm -hmm. And just like, normally I'm up here and with dairy, I was like down here. And for me, that's, right. I lived a decade with chronic depression. And if I'm not in the best mood I could possibly have, it's just unacceptable because mm -hmm. I've, I've just been in a bad place and I want to be in the best place I can possibly be. And dairy is not helping with that for me personally. And to clarify, I don't think dairy is bad for everyone. It seems to be very individual. And mm -hmm. I think part of it is maybe on the health context or something like that, where like, I didn't have an issue with dairy before. And it was only after that experiment where I induced hyperinsulinemia and went back to eating high fat carnivore with dairy that I started having issues with it. I know plenty of people who can eat all the cheese they want and they're perfectly fine. So not to scare anyone <laughs> off of dairy. Right. It's more of like, <laughs> you have to experiment. And if you're running into trouble, just keep trying different things and eventually you'll come across something and figure out what you're looking for. So it's, it's good that's... that you're, you're giving some flexibility on the dairy side, because otherwise you would have never been able to visit France. I mean, they wouldn't have let you in the territory. <laughs> so it would have been, you know, yeah. a just big no-no. Banned, just banned from the <laughs> yeah. country forever. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, Sweden too, they're big on dairy. Yeah. And yeah. So for sure. So you, you mentioned uh, mood and anxiety and a couple of, uh, and depression. And that leads me to the other subject that I wanted to talk about, which is the recent depression trials that have mm -hmm. been carried out by Robin Carhart Harris and his group at Imperial College London in the UK. They've, they've done a trial where they were looking at psilocybin, which is the, uh, the uh, pro drug in the uh, magic mushroom, uh, which uh, mm -hmm. transforms uh, 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 psilocin, the active uh, compound that affects the serotonin receptors and gives you all the effects and all of that versus an antidepressant, which is escitalopram, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is pr very common, you know, second generation antidepressant. And basically they had uh, an interesting uh, result. But before I go into that, the reason I'm bringing it up is because I want to make the link between uh, metabolic health, fat loss, uh, and uh, depression. I think there's a lot there. And how and, and uh, the, the context of that question is how do you separate out the fact of knowing that you are uh, thinner, or, or you've lost fat, you look better, you're lighter, you can move better, that people look at you differently, because we're very social animals. So that has to come into play in, in mood to some extent. So how would you personally differentiate those? And, and then yeah, then just talk about how depression is treated in general, uh, what is your experience there, uh, what do you think about the different alternatives people have, and, and yeah, if anything you want to say about, about those, uh, those compounds, but I'll just briefly mention the primary outcome, which was this particular depression scale, was not statistically significantly better uh, between both of them, but all the other scales were the secondary outcomes, um, and some very interesting stuff so it's uh it's pretty encouraging ac actually despite that so yeah i'll just i'll just let you go on that give me your thoughts and then i'll i'll jump in yeah for sure so for the first question i've definitely had that asked before like oh of course you were no longer depressed you lost weight and therefore you felt better about yourself blah 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 but for me i don't 
think that vibes with my own experience. Like, yes, I was losing weight and it was very exciting, but at the same time I had lost weight through different methods before through calorie restriction. And sure, this was more than that, but it was around the same. The only real difference was that I wasn't hungry. <laughs> so I guess I could have been more excited, but on the other hand, I've also run into things like the honey butter thing or like things like that, where it can trigger symptoms again, or the high carb experiment where it was a two month after effect. And the thing with that is sure. I gained weight during the high carb experiment, but I didn't feel bad about gaining weight at the time mm -hmm. because I was like, I know that this is going to happen. I'm going to gain weight from this experiment and it may take a little while for it to come off. And it's not like I did anything wrong. It's not like I didn't have the discipline to stick with keto and I feel horrible for myself. It was a planned intervention. I knew weight gain was going to be one of the outcomes. I didn't expect mood to be one of the outcomes because I had specifically formulated it to try and be a healthier, high carb diet, whole food, all that type mm -hmm. of stuff. And I ended up having a mood impact anyway. And it wasn't just like, I felt bad about myself because I had gained weight. Like I said, it was, everything was tainted by it where I had to go to keto fest right after, like a couple days after that experiment ended. And I had done this presentation that is one of my favorites. I was talking about insulin resistance and the immune system and how that ties into weight gain and stuff like that. And like people were coming up to me after the presentation, like, I'm so glad you talked about this. It made so much sense, like really excited. And just in my head, it was like, they're lying to you. <laughs> like right. they hated it. They didn't understand any of it. They don't care at all, whatever. And for me, because I have this experience of chronic depression and not being chronically depressed, I know what genuinely reacting to something in a negative way feels like versus completely inappropriately negative. So I often get into arguments with myself in my head of self-analyzing my own behavior and my own reactions, because that's mm -hmm. what I had to do with depression because I knew my reactions were often unreasonable. And so now during that, it's like, okay, wait, 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 wait. You're having this kind of reaction where you felt you did terribly, but that is not matching up with the evidence in this case. And I was even checking with other people and they're like, no, it was great, blah, blah, blah. And like, these are people who will give me very sincere feedback on things. If I didn't do well, they will tell me as much. And so I was able to be like, okay, this is not a normal response. This is like something external influencing my own perception of reality, which I've experienced before with depression. So mm -hmm. it was that similar kind of mechanism going on. And again, the exact opposite. When I went keto, I sure lost weight. I was feeling better, but at the same time, it's like my entire perception changed. It's not mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm thinner now and thus everything is good. It's like, oh, I am actually really lucky to have the family that I do, to have the friends that I do. I actually like my job. I, you know, and at the time I still thought like, oh, I'm still fat. And honestly, I couldn't tell a huge amount of difference with the weight I had lost 240 pounds to 220 pounds. I was still pretty big, but I was just in a completely different mindset. And because it can be triggered back to that pessimism side again, mm -hmm. I have a feeling there's something metabolic or inflammation related that's actually impacting my own thought processes in a way, not necessarily my weight. And right. yeah, so I can have temporary influence as well that's not influencing my weight. So they seem to be pretty divorced from each other. Mm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, and it's the 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 way you're describing it to me, and tell me if I'm if I'm wrong here, there's there's um there's an aspect where you're much more aware of of how you're feeling when you're feeling well and when you're depressed you you tend to get stuck in these in these cycles of negativity and it's it's yeah. hard to address a lot of the a lot of the questions you need to address and you know there's there some of the way this is described is you know as avoidance and that's actually one of the the scales that are used in the well not the scale but the symptoms shall we say 
um, or the outcome, right? The outcome of avoidance in the, in the anti-depression trials. And that was something that was improved by, by psilocybin, which is kind of interesting because it seems to be those sort of things that are needed for sustainable changes. And I think that once you understand that when you have like a brute force intervention, which is calorie restriction, uh, which creates hunger, which is literally used as a torture device uh, on, on people, and and it's like you're 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 not addressing the the factors of, of of the fat loss by going down this road. And I think with depression, it's it's mixed into food in a way where, of course, you feel bad about the choices you make when you see that they're not working or when you see that that you're you're probably going to lose them. Right? That's what you were scared of, mm -hmm. what you were saying earlier on. And I think to get out of of depression, you can to get out of the the, the state of being depressed, you can obviously use diet because I think it, it, it's going to work for a lot of people, the, the quality of their diet and, and stuff like their metabolic health. Um, but there's also the tools, the pharmacological tools, um, which can break you out of that loop of negativity. Um, and that's really interesting to me because it's, it sounds like a more sustainable approach compared to the classical antidepressant approach, which is to essentially numb and to lower the excursions of the peaks and the valleys, essentially. Yeah. And I can't comment personally on that because I've never been on antidepressants, but it's funny because one of the other approaches to depression is DBT and therapy and all that type of stuff. But what I've found is even if I can recognize the negative behavior and the rumination of just going over the same thing over and over and over again, even if I recognize it is extremely hard to break out of it. If I'm not right. in a good mental place already, which is like, mm -hmm. okay, to fix your depression, you have to not be depressed kind of thing. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's that kind of thing where you can observe it, you can identify it, you can try to change the behavior. But the other problem that I was experiencing with depression is even if I identified that, like you're being unreasonable, and this is not an appropriate response. It's not like, okay, I feel great now. It would just be like arguing with myself and then it created an entirely new, <laughs> new right. spiral of, well, you're being unreasonable. No, I'm not like, oh, my feelings are valid. This is blah, blah, blah. And then it would just create an entirely new thing. And meanwhile, it seems like keto for me is doing similar to what you're talking about where it breaks that cycle and I just don't even fall into it in the first place after a while. And one thing I've noticed is even if difficult things happen, I just handle them so much better. And in the reverse, if I'm not eating well, then I don't handle them well at all. Like there was an event here in Boulder a couple, uh, a little while ago. And at the time I was still eating dairy and I could feel the not proper response coming up where I was ruminating on it a lot and I was getting stuck in these negative thoughts and feeling that gut level visceral reaction to it mm -hmm. even after several weeks had passed and that was concerning to me because I've had PTSD before and I had to deal with that for a very long time and there were multiple things I did to address it. One of the things that helped was actually going carnivore, <laughs> weirdly. Right. It got a lot worse. And then I was able to actually think about what happened and process it and go through it. And finally, I ended up getting counseling for it as well, which helped. And now I can think about it and there's not that gut level reaction. And so seeing that happening again to another event that had happened in my community was very concerning to me. And I was even considering reaching out to that counselor again, because it's like, I seriously don't want to let this sit and just become mm -hmm. another huge problem I have to deal with again. And then I decided to go dairy free. <laughs> and a month later, I was like, oh yeah, that thing, like I've thought about it, but I've thought about it in a healthy way. And it feels mm -hmm. like I've now processed it. And it's like, would that have happened if I had still been eating dairy? Because while I was, it's like it was getting worse, not better. And so I can't really say, oh, yes, not eating dairy, like influence this or whatever. But it seemed to correlate. 
in a very significant way. And it's like, oh, okay. So yeah. one thing that they talk about in regards to epilepsy is a seizure threshold. Everybody has a seizure threshold mm -hmm. and those with epilepsy have a lower threshold. And for me, after experiencing that, it's like everyone has a trauma threshold where they will experience something and they will become traumatized from it and potentially develop PTSD and all this other stuff. Well, it seems like, at least in my case, my trauma threshold is being influenced by diet, just like depression is, where if I'm eating in such a way that is not healthy for me, for whatever mechanistic reason that is, it's lower. And if I fix it, it goes back up to more of a normal person's or whatever. And it's mm -hmm. very bizarre. But when I started thinking about it like that, it started making a lot more sense. And maybe it's similar mechanisms. Maybe it's not. I don't know. That's more of just something I've been spitballing for a little while. Of, well, oh, I'll, like that. I'll throw out a, 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 something speculative. Um, you could imagine it happening if you had, for example, peripheral effects, so neuroendocrine peripheral effects. So say you had, you know, hyperinsulinemia or some sort of wacky LPS load, which was activating uh, your, your, your CNS, and that this had uh, these peripheral effects, which could correlate with obesity, could also uh, have re repercussions in the brain, for example, right? Because uh, most, oh, most, I'm exaggerating, a lot of our brain is made of microglia, which are these immune cells. Um, mm -hmm. And they're very reactive. They get activated and they're, they're there when there's physical trauma to the brain. And there's, they're reacting also to peripheral inputs um, as well, like a lot, of, a lot of the brain is. So I don't think it's a big stretch to imagine how that could happen. Uh, how it happens, I think, is yet to be discovered. And for the epileptic uh, mice that I was reading about a couple of years ago, it was the, a function of their microbiome producing certain uh, amino acids. And those were signaling the GABA glutamate ratio in the brain, right? They were making it more excitatory. So they were lowering that uh, epilepsy threshold. And so the ketogenic diet was modulating the gut bugs. So that was the idea for epilepsy. And why wouldn't you have that for anxiety slash trauma or, or uh, resilience, you might say, depression? You know, this is once you've opened the door for one, it's very hard to make the argument that it's not going to happen for the other ones. Right. Uh, it's, right. And I definitely yeah. think it's important to acknowledge at the same time, like just because this worked for me, just because this seems to be influencing right. for me, doesn't mean it's going to work the same way in other people. And it could be like a ketogenic diet helps for someone, but they still need medication or to go with a psilocybin trial or whatever it is, like yeah. in therapy and trauma counseling. And like, I've used multiple different approaches as well. Mm -hmm. So, and I think a lot of it is going to factor into like, what is actually triggering the depression in the first place. If it's situational depression where you're reacting to something in your environment that may be very different from chronic depression where it may be something metabolic or microbiome related or inflammation in the brain or things like that and i had read some stuff a while ago that was talking about how inflammation in the brain can basically cause what you see when you're sick but like ramped up really high so when you get the flu you're exhausted you're unmotivated you can be kind of pessimistic you don't feel well, like all that type of stuff. And that's protective in that situation where, okay, you have the flu. This is a very uh, energy intensive process to fight this off. Just sit, stay there. Don't do anything. Don't think about anything. Just stay don't still. think you're so good that you can go change the world. You're worthless. Stay home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Just exactly. Wallow. That's what and the then, flu is telling you. And then once you get over the flu, you have all this abundant energy again, the metabolic processes and immunological processes aren't going on anymore. Inflammation in the brain has gone back to normal levels. And then it's like, oh, I don't know what I was thinking about. I want to go read a book, go on a walk, all this type of stuff. And so perhaps with metabolic syndrome, something similar can happen. I mean, this is just pure speculation here where you have this peripheral unhealthiness in the body and that's being reflected in the brain and you have this almost sick response to just, it's just chronic depression, chronic flu symptoms kind of. Yeah, I mean, maybe. It's, it's 
it's you know it's like trying to predict how things are go gonna go wrong in a complex system that's just like so hard and that's you know yeah. in immunology especially right because you've got so many layers of, of regulation there but so i wanted to uh, jump to another topic uh, which is a personal fat threshold which is a, a favorite a cudgel in the low carb community mm -hmm. um and it's uh, it's interesting to me because I think it's one of those concepts which sort of it's like it has this gravitational attraction back towards Chico land, where everyone is like progressively pulled towards that direction. There's like the personal fat threshold. There's like hyper palatability and rewarding aspects of food, and then there's the satiety index, and it's all of those and the protein to energy ratio, which are all concepts that are trying to to sort of flatten the importance in the differences in macronutrients, the importance in the type of fats, the importance of the metabolic states in which an isocaloric or eucaloric diet, uh, different diets can be given. It's, these things like all flatten, they don't, and they lower the explanatory potential, I think of what we're seeing in people. And that's, that's my gripe with them because you can say, oh, you're being kind of picky one at a time, but when you look at it all together, you, you can understand the narrative that these concepts start to weave together. And, and it's one of those things where it's, it's, I think people are mistaking descriptions for explanations so much of the time. And yeah, so just please rant on that. Yeah, as far as personal fat threshold goes, I'm going to defer completely to Gavor because <laughs> he was the one who brought it to my right. attention and then like he did a total 180 and he was like, never mind, I was wrong. This isn't how I was thinking of it. And I yeah. really totally untrustworthy that. guy, by the way. <laughs> Someone who can change their mind like that. Pff, yeah, drifters, he got new you. information and was yeah. like, never mind, I changed my mind. Which yeah, isn't to say that there isn't a threshold in certain contexts, but the way that I've been thinking of it now is a contextual fat threshold where the immune system may play in. He shared studies talking about like introducing LPS and triggering a threshold stuff like that. And it's like, okay, so this kind of lines up with the way that I think about metabolic syndrome in general, which is chronic immune activation. And we see all the similar things, altered glucose response, altered um, glucose sensitivity, the higher inflammatory markers, all this type of stuff, but it's just over an extremely long period of time. It's like, okay, if that's the case, then maybe in that state, it's triggering a contextual fat threshold in some people and then they start developing other things like diabetes and all that type of stuff and it's been brought up somewhat that oh but you know people of asian descent tend to have a lower fat threshold so you know how do you argue against that well gabor again has brought up if you take those people stick them in the u.s they'll get fat just right. like everybody else so to me that doesn't shout solely genetic i'm sure there are again genetic components to it it sounds more like it's a context thing which is important to acknowledge for sure because if we can understand exactly the context where that is happening and what's triggering it in the food environment sleep environment whatever it is then that would be great <laughs> that would be fantastic mm -hmm. that would mean regardless of low carb high carb plant-based carnivore whatever we can say as long as you avoid these things, that's probably not going to happen. What I'm kind of concerned about is people getting stuck on one idea, and then we end up with the same situation because we haven't addressed the actual problem <laughs> down yeah. the road. And yeah, so personal fat threshold, I think, is important to consider. But also, if we look at the contrary evidence to it, I don't think it stands up at that point that it's solely genetic I think it's definitely being influenced by the immune system, by the environment, the environment's effect on the immune system, diet, all that type of stuff. And it also may help us understand like when people are in this sick state of metabolic syndrome, why are they responding so well to ketogenic and low carb diets or carnivorous diets for that matter? And it doesn't appear to be solely due to ketosis or ketogenesis or anything like that. So what is it exactly? Because if you go from keto to carnivore, you're not necessarily more ketogenic, but some people see a great response to that. And if we look at it in terms of, you know, dietary irritants, a lot of irritants are in plants. And if you're in the sick state, you may be more vulnerable to those. So maybe removing them helps you improve a little bit. 
And then the other major question is like, why do some people respond so well to high fat, low carb or carnivorous diets compared to higher protein? I've seen both cases. I've seen people respond really, really well to the PE type of formula where they're increasing their protein and restricting energy. They lean out, feel great, whatever. But then I've also seen other people, including myself, where if we do that, we just get hungry and we don't <laughs> lose weight yeah. easily. But then if we do the reverse where we ramp up fat and sometimes using like a fat first approach where you eat fat until you're full and then you eat your lean until you're full and it ends up being like there's these two separate hungers that you're addressing, making sure to get your energy in so you're not using protein as energy, all this type of stuff, then we experience greater satiety and we start losing weight. Like, why is that? I <laughs> like it's kind of frustrating because it can come across like I'm criticizing PE and like, oh, it's not going to work for anybody. But no, I don't think that's true. I think it is going to work for people. And the people that I tend to see it work with are more metabolically healthy, more the fitness types, more those types of people. Although other people have commented that they've seen success with it, even when not metabolically healthy. What I'm saying is I don't think we should ignore the people where the opposite is true. And for me personally, I want to understand why there is that difference. I don't know, but maybe it relates again to the immune response and influencing it through all these different mechanisms, the gut microbiome, who knows, but I want to look into it more and understand it better because it's first of all, relevant to a lot of people, because I know people who have gone keto while diabetic and obese and have not seen results and they switched to high protein carnivore and they didn't see results and they did PE and they didn't see results. And these are severely diabetic people with very high insulin and concerning. I would like, if that were a family member, I would be concerned for them. And then they try high fat carnivore, no spices, no dairy. And all of a sudden their diabetes starts resolving. They start losing weight. They start experiencing satiety for the first time. And it's like, okay, that's a big deal. <laughs> like if this is going to pop up, even if they're edge cases, even if they're outliers, the, they're still people <laughs> that need help. Right. So I want to be able to understand. And what would be great is if we could look at a person and say, do you experience this? Do you experience this? Do you experience this? Okay. This is going to work for you because I mean, it's a frustrating aspect that a lot of this is just trial and error and we want yeah. things to work the first time, not the 15th time, not the 20th time. We want to be able to say, do this and you will get healthy. And I don't think we currently have that, although we're getting closer for sure, but it's still so much left to explore and getting stuck on one idea and not wanting to update your perspective because it's like, well, this works for most people. And it's like, great, but what about the people where it doesn't, <laughs> it's not helping them. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, for me, the, the, P to E ratio is a heuristic, meaning if you want to you wanna try the experiment of increasing your protein uh, to the detriment of your carbs or fat, and you wanna, you're, you're figuring out how to do this, you're like, oh yeah, if I think of it in terms of how much protein to how much energy, okay, cool, I'll do that. Like, yeah, if that's how you want to use the P to E uh, ratio, that's totally fine. But when you make it into like, a hypothesis or, or even a theory, if someone would dare to make it into a theory. Well, it's kind of ridiculous because it, it's, it's, it fails instantly. Like it doesn't distinguish between carbs and fat. It just doesn't. Right. So. Yeah. And we've I, already seen yeah. that there's a difference or different fat it types, like all this type of stuff. Right. It has to come it's into like, consideration. It's, it's too, it's too easily shown to, to not actually work out, which is fine, which is why it should be a heuristic. But when you set, when you, when you push that as the frame, the primary framework for approaching your diet, that's the problem. It's kind of like calorie restriction. Calorie restriction is a tool. It is a totally logical tool to have when affecting body composition. That calorie restriction could mean not eating for certain periods of time that's in the time dimension it could mean um, um how you apportion those calories during the day right you're you're restricting certain areas and others there's a million ways of of calorie restricting then there's the chronic type right so they're tools but they're not theories of obesity they're not primary strategies of achieving this they're not root cause 
inspired frameworks. And that's, I think, the, the big frustration is this is like, I kind of know what you mean, but you're talking about, you know, an anthill and, and actually I'm, I'm talking about this way bigger thing here and, and yours is a description and a tool. And I'm talking about an, ex, an explanation, a theory, something which is going to explain more and more stuff, not less and less. Because if, if I bring up more and more anecdotes about how a higher protein diet hasn't worked, um, th that should be interesting to you right that you should yeah, be trying to I be agree. like why is that because it's yeah. not intuitive i'll be honest like my my even still now i will tend tend if i'm imagining speaking to a thousand people in the street i will tend to tell them go higher protein because it's my way it's my heuristic to get them to eat more animal foods right yeah. which you're basically just, displacing right? things that aren't good sources exactly of protein. exactly and you're doing yeah. it with the 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 most the, the thing that's going to be most beneficial, right, on average. But, but I think it's, but there's still a significant amount of people who are going to do well with, you know, a higher proportion of fat, even though I would, my instincts and what I actually do is I tend to recommend higher protein. But, but I don't know, I've seen enough examples you have in yourself and others. And I know a lot of the low carb people pushing this have, but I don't get why it's not getting through to them that it actually matters that we upgrade our models and that's fine and you can still sell diet books and you can just sell the new update right you don't have to get yeah. stuck on the old model <laughs> i mean it's, it's like software right like even right. if we acknowledge oh well we thought it was like this but actually a much better way to think about it is this and so we right. upgraded our software and it has all these new features blah 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 that's cool <laughs> that doesn't make the software right. bad. <laughs> right. It just means you're acknowledging that as we learn things, we need to update how we think and we need to make sure that we're checking ourselves because I mean, sure, this is all discussion within the low carb community, but there are also people outside of the low carb community who are going to be scrutinizing us for yeah. faulty logic and cognitive bias and all this type of stuff. And honestly, just for our own just our own well-being <laughs> we should yeah. be trying to strive for am i being honest with myself am i making sure that i'm paying attention to the outliers of you know things that contradict how i think things should work because mm -hmm. even though it's frustrating to work really hard on this one thing and come up with this idea and get it all cemented and in place and then come up with a heuristic to address it if it's not right it's not it's just it's not right. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. That's the, I had a conversation about this uh, with uh, Nick Norwitz. Um, it was really interesting. Uh, I, I like uh, I like talking to him because we we have some interesting disagreements. Um, but yeah, it's it's all you know all these concepts. Uh, the satiety index is another one. Like, it's it's one of those things where there is something called satiety. There is something that's satiation. Yet we only talk about one, not the other. Um, it's, they're very hard to measure, right? Just like depression scales are terrible in psychiatry. Well, yeah, satiety I've, index is an absolutely terrible nutrition scale. Yeah. Uh, I've had discussions with <laughs> other people about this of like, well, we don't really know what satiety is. And from my view, having experienced it, it's like, no, <laughs> it's right. very distinct. But the yeah. problem is if you've never experienced it, all these people saying, in describing what satiety is, they just sound completely wacko. Yeah. <laughs> like I, yeah. I could eat forever until my stomach explodes. Okay, then you have not experienced satiety. Yeah. It is not a physical fullness. It right. is not <laughs> deciding by yourself to stop eating. It is not getting bored with your food. It is that sensation where you have your fork halfway to your mouth and you look at it and you just can't bear the thought it's just like there's a force field yeah. right here you can't get it there and you just have to put it down right. and walk away but if you've never experienced that that sounds completely nuts <laughs> like yeah. what are you talking about i always finish yeah. my plate i always whatever and for me when i was doing the high fat carnivore experiment i was terrified like you want me to eat all this fat until i can't have any more because not because i'm physically full not be, just because i'm satiated what does that mean what do you mean that's not gonna work i'm gonna eat like a million calories and then i'm gonna get hugely <laughs> fat and then i'm gonna die and it's gonna be your fault <laughs> and sure there was a couple of days of transition but it happened and i got fat satiated 
And then I ate my lean portion and I got satiated on that. And I was completely satiated, satiety, satiation all at once. But if I had never experienced it, I would have been like, what you are saying is impossible. You are nuts. Mm -hmm. You had no idea what you're talking about. And so that's why I like recommending to people like, oh, should I go higher protein? Should I go higher fat? You know what? Just take a month, do one of them, take the next month, do the other one, and then stick to the one that works best or somewhere in the middle or whatever. Just try both because I can't tell you currently what's going to work for you. I just can't because I don't know the mechanism of why this is working in the first place. And I'm going to have to be honest with you about that. And I hope we do figure it out. But until then, just try both and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, the worst is you have a sucky month and it doesn't work. All right. Yeah. And, and um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with Tyler Cartwright, who often of uh, Keto Gains, who often describes that he, don't, he doesn't ever think he'll experience the type of satiety someone like me to, uh, experiences. And it's really interesting. He's, he's, he's very forthright about it. And he's like, look, like your theories are great, but it, it just doesn't work for me. And I, I'm a big proponent of keto and I get it, but you know, you still need to, I, st I still need to, you know, resistance train and, and restrict to some degree. But on the other hand, I don't think he's torturing himself. I mean, he's, he didn't give me that impression. I don't think he would say that either. I think he would, he'd be pretty happy with what's working, but he is talking about purposeful chronic restriction, I think, to some degree, if I'm, if I'm not mangling what, what he explained to me. So it's kind of interesting because, you know, he, he lost a shit ton of weight. So he's, he, he also has a lot of experience Literally, on that side. What he is doing is working for him. Yeah. And at the same time, yeah. I don't want to just say, oh, well, you know, that's working for you, whatever, and then just dismiss it. Like, right. I want to pay attention to that and try and think of why is that happening? Like, yeah. is it something long-term where you have to go through a whole bunch of stuff in order to just try? And how and come it? is he not gaining weight? If he's never satiated, why is he not gaining weight? Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> I don't know. That's the answer this, currently. I don't right? know. It's kind of interesting because, right, right. Because it's like, okay, we have this theory that if you eat the most satiating foods, you're going to eat less and you're going to lose fat. Okay. This guy's lost fat. Maybe he's more satiated than he was before, but he's clearly not as satiated as he needs to be. So he would still be in a positive caloric balance. However, as long as he has a, you know, he's not normally satiated, right? As the theory goes. So to my mind, it's like, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. I don't know how to explain the, 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 the like phenomenology of, of Tyler because he's, <laughs> he's, he's, it's, yeah, it was super interesting to me. So yeah. I don't and know like, what to do for with that. Me, if I eat dairy, which is anti-satiating for me, then I'll gain to a certain level and then I'll stop. And the same was true with higher protein carnivore. I'll gain to a certain level and then I'll stop. I won't keep gaining, but like it just hits this point and then it levels out. So it's like if I eat more satiating foods, which for me is higher fat, it's like I get full here and my weight goes here. I don't know what the lower level is because I haven't reached it yet. Mm -hmm. But if I include dairy or higher protein, it's more like up here. So it's not like a continual gaining. It's just maintaining at a slightly higher level. So maybe the same thing is happening there. And I know other people who have commented that they never get satiated, like uh, Steak and Iron on Twitter, he said that, like, I never get satiated. I have to restrict the same kind of thing. And I think he said that actually changed when he cut out dairy. He started getting oh. satiated when he cut out dairy. He'll have to fact check me on that. If that's incorrect, right. I apologize. But I'm pretty sure I saw that coming from him. It's like, hmm. So maybe there's something that's slightly disrupting. So it's not yeah. causing a continual gain, but it's just maintaining at a slightly higher level. And yeah, I've experienced that same thing. So maybe that is just what's happening. It's just offsetting a little bit. Hmm. No, that's, uh, yeah. I have to think about that some more, but it's... Uh... It's it's not it's certainly not a boring question to to consider these things and there's another there's one other example that I like to to bring up because for me it's so palpable um, and it's kind of very very much repeatable so 
if you if you subscribe to the idea that the more rewarding food is, the more palatable something is, the more you're going to eat of it, the more you're going to get fat and so on and so forth, right? Once I don't, again. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Right. From my own personal experience, I don't buy it. Because yeah. here's a fun fact. Before I cut out plants, I did not enjoy food. I did not get physical pleasure. You know, the goosebumps, the, oh, this is so good. I remember being a teenager and my sister had made like this shortcake or something and she was trying it and she was going like, oh, this is so good. Like all that type of like visceral reaction to the delicious right. food. And I had some and I was like, yeah, it's good. And I genuinely thought people who did that were lying to me. <laughs> <laughs> they were just exaggerating <laughs> and it was only after i went carnivore after i cut out plants that i started experiencing that mm -hmm. physical pleasure getting goosebumps from what i was eating being really excited for meals enjoying them just like scarfing it down oh this is awesome this is delicious all that type of stuff and i have had points like the high carb experiment or um at one point i had been like volunteering at a conference and so i had some plants at that point and I had it instantly gone. It's just like, this is whatever, just no reaction in my brain at all. And yet, what do I lose weight best with carnivore where food is incredibly pleasurable for me and I get a physical visceral reaction to the food. Food you, highly eat, palatable. you have eaten before as well, right? You would still yeah. eat meat yeah, yeah. before. Yep. So it's kind yeah, of like the would, same food as well. Before. But it's just yeah. when plants are added, it's doing something weird and i'm sure again this sounds completely nuts like what do you mean you add plants and you can't enjoy food i don't know dude yeah. <laughs> like explain <laughs> it to me i would like to know but so i have experienced the total opposite and the difference is high fat carnivore for me is both incredibly pleasurable it's a very hedonistic experience but it's also very satiating so it's not like I go and like, oh, that sounds so delicious that after I eat this meal, I'm going to wait a couple hours. I'm going to eat even more of it because it's just that good. No, it's like, I don't even want to think about food for a long time. And it'll be to the point where like I'll smell food or I'll see like really fatty food and I'll just almost be like repulsed by like, oh, don't even show that to right. me. I'm way too <laughs> sick right now to even think about that. <laughs> And, and, and you can experiment with that. So people can experiment with that because they can, they can smoke pot or eat an edible or, or vape pot. They can get the munchies, which is going to, whoops, which is going to increase the reward, which is going to make the, the food uh, be more palatable, right? It's going to very profoundly change their subjective and, you know, their subjective experience here. So you can do that. And yes, you will eat more in the immediate uh, phase, but later on or the day later, you'll compensate. Um, but if it, and the reason why it's because it's not disrupting uh, anything in the whatever regulation of appetite system we have, mm -hmm. it's not disrupting it, it's, all it's the pulling signals. it. Yep, we yeah. have all this energy available the next day when the pot wears off, whatever. And then yeah. you'll just, okay, let's wait until we need some more energy again. And that's been right. my exact experience. Full disclosure, <laughs> right? I have done pot before. Um, I How prefer edibles. Right. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's legal in Colorado. I've not broken any laws. I actually yeah. didn't try it before I moved to Colorado because I was like, well, it's illegal. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those goody two-shoes people. Um, right. And, and but, for me, so, it's always been this interesting like self-experiment. Because uh, you can see that, first, well, first of all, we know pot doesn't make you fat. We have a lot of epidemiological data that it's even favorable in terms of the um, uh, pathological insulin resistance that, that's favoring some sort of activation of the CB1, maybe CB2 receptor. It's not, it's not very clear, but we, so we have all this data and you can try it out on yourself and you can see that effect. And yet, I don't know why, I've never heard an obesity researcher explain this to me. Like why this doesn't totally disprove the, the idea right. that reward. Like the, the stereotypical stoner is like the shaggy type, right? Like super thin, right. munchies all the time, eating whatever garbage, and yet they're thin. I have honestly never thought about it either. I guess because, I don't know, I didn't really know stoners in the first place. But right. yeah, when you start thinking about it, it's like, that's 
really interesting. So they're getting hungrier while they're high, but they're not getting fat. Like why? They're not. Why though? <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing. And if, of course, if you come with the framework that many more and more people are having the low carb community and pretty much everyone hell else has elsewhere, you know, like just eat your gruel to stay, to stay thin. Um, it's, it's very difficult to explain if you don't come at it with any a priori, it's interesting, but you're not like, you can, you can still operate, right. You can still be like, okay, well, at least it's not disrupting whatever mechanism is important there. What seems to disrupt it is, you know, linoleic acid at the adipocyte, it's flour, the, uh, incretin level and, and sugar probably acting in, through the microbiome as well. I mean, you've got some very good candidates for, for disrupting that, that energy partitioning system. But yet we, we focus on these sort of behavioral things that are consequences, not causes of, of you know, the outcomes we're, we're seeking. So it's, it's kind of frustrating. We're spinning our wheels, I think, conceptually with these things. Yeah, for sure. And I think like all of these different examples are so, so fascinating. And it's like, I just want to learn as much about them as possible. Right. And <laughs> on a related topic regarding the yeah. munchies, like I know you've been interested in this, how munchies may change depending on your baseline diet. And mm. I've heard that from people who eat sugar and then they go carnivore stoner the entire time. And they're like, oh yeah, when I eat sugar, I crave sugar. But after I've been carnivore, when I'm high, I start craving like carnivore bars. So pemmican, really right. fatty, basically like protein bar type of things or steak or burgers or whatever. And I've actually never been high while not carnivore. So mm -hmm. I can only <laughs> comment on the one thing, but I have been high while eating dairy and I've been high while not eating dairy. And there's definitely a difference and I think I'll eat even more when I'm having dairy as the baseline. And if I'm not, I'll just really want like burgers with a bunch of butter on it or something. And then, like you said, yeah. I'll, I'll offset the next day. I won't get hungry for a while later. Yeah. I, I, I find it really interesting because, you know, cannabinoids have been used as an obesity drug, Syn synthetic cannabinoids, you know, what is it? Remonobans if I'm not getting the name right. So it worked pretty well. Problem is people wanted to kill themselves. Small, oh, small hitch, right? So yeah. we know that the cannabinoids have some pretty powerful effects on, on appetite. And it's such a good example that you don't understand the complex system. You, you know that you can mess with it at this point. You mess with it. You get a great result, which is totally not worth it because you've messed up 10 other things, which literally make people want to kill, kill themselves. Think about that. Pot makes people feel so good, yet when they try the synthetic weight loss version, people want to kill themselves. It's it's kind yeah, of that's interesting how. Yeah, I would imagine there must be <laughs> multiple components working to help regulate it and keep it at like a higher mood. And if you just give them one isolated compound, it all falls apart because there's not that feedback built into it. Yeah, there's um. It, it might be what some people refer to as the entourage effect, which is being studied by uh, Michael Sordegren, uh, if I'm getting his name right. He was on my podcast a couple couple weeks ago, a month or two ago, and he's at Imperial College studying the entourage effect. And that's what many people invoke to explain why pot doesn't, it's, it's acting so widely in a sense um, in the CNS, in the ANS. You know, it's it's also not acting in important places where we don't want it to act. We don't want it to act on potassium channels of the heart and like, you know, other drugs. So it's sort of um, dispersed where you would want it in terms of safety, safety profile. But yeah, a lot of these one target, you know, approach, one target, one drug approach, uh, pharmacologically speaking, it's, it's really hard to get right. And that's why I'm so impressed when it does turn out to work. Like when you get something like metformin, that's amazing. It, it's not like it's not rev. It's, it hasn't changed the diabetes epidemic for shit. Let's not let's not get it twisted. But it's a pretty good drug. Um, you know, it's pretty safe. It's it's got it's got its uses. And it was uh, what was it discovered from? Some sort of bark or some root or something, yeah, uh, something or flower. Like that. A Probably French some lily. Plant. I think a French lily. Yeah, some something like that. Um, and it's just amazing to see the the little little factory that, that plants can be 
uh, for us. And and we and when we manage to to be attentive enough to figure out that what they're doing is having an effect, and we can use it without killing ourselves or <laughs> making it suicidal, <laughs> like antidepressants do. By the way, I've been on a on a down a rabbit hole. Um, maybe we can we can end on that. Um, but yeah, it's it's always amazing we we can get drugs right, and that's hard because we often don't get them right. They're, yeah. they're difficult. I mean. Even even carnivores will often admit like meat is food, plants are medicine. <laughs> so right. caffeine, that's a medicine. THC, yeah. that's a medicine. All that type of stuff. And just to clarify, before I get people coming at me on Twitter, I only do <laughs> very low sugar edibles. Just in case right. you <laughs> <laughs> gluten-free low sugar. <laughs> It actually is. I'm very picky right. about it. And I've made yeah. my own before with butter. It's not hard. I, I've made, I've, yeah, I've I made my own with butter years ago when I was at university in London. It was it's so fun. I haven't done it in forever. <laughs> I have to do that again. But yeah, the, the, I don't know if it's, no, we shouldn't end on that, but I'll just mention it quickly. <laughs> the, uh, cause it's too depressing. But yeah, antidepressants for people who don't know, uh, in the first, two to three or three to four weeks that you get on antidepressants, that's where your risk of suicide increases the most. That's very mm -hmm. counterintuitive. Depre people who are depressed are more likely to kill themselves and we give them a drug that makes them more depressed than someone taking a placebo. Yeah, and from what I've heard of people who have had experience taking them, what they experienced was they were still depressed, but the antidepressant made them more motivated, which is not right. A exactly. Good combination, yep. which is why with any medication, like you have to be very carefully supervised in yeah. contact with people and even like contacting your own family and stuff. Like I've been recommended that even just when changing diet, like for the high carb experiment, like make absolutely sure you are in contact with people very close to you and you are being honest with them about your mental state, because even if you're formulating this to be more safe, like you just have no way of knowing what impact it's going to have. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's one of those things where they're giving out like Tic Tacs and, and they shouldn't be. Um, and yet we freak people out uh, for trying a diet that might raise their LDL 10, 10 milligrams, you know, per deciliter. Like we've, mm. we've got it so upside down in, in that regard. Um, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. On, on that note, I'm pretty interested in the uh, psilocybin outcomes because, mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, what are, what are the side effects of taking too much of that exactly? Like what, nausea? Feeling kind of weird? <laughs> I mean... Yeah. All things considered, stuff like that seems like a decent bet, even if the effectiveness is on par or slightly below. It seems like a good frontline choice of let's try this because we know it doesn't have a lot of side effects and it may be beneficial. It's kind of like the risk reward thing that Amber talks about in terms of trying carnivore for like bipolar yeah. disorder or mood disorder, stuff like that. It's not guaranteed to work. But also dietary therapies tend to be low risk in terms of harm. So you can try it, see if it works. And then if it doesn't work, you can just move up the ladder to the next thing that's slightly higher risk, slightly more beneficial and so on. And hopefully as we get more information, we can kind of refine our response to this type of thing and say, oh, you're depressed. Okay, let's try this. If it doesn't work, we'll do this and so on. And hopefully catch a bunch of people at the lower levels where it's like, oh, this first thing we tried actually worked and mm -hmm. you don't have to do anything else. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, you know, these are short term trials. So when we're weighing the risks and, and benefits, we have to realize that with psilocybin, the idea is not that you have to take this every day. It's going to be two, three times, maybe over a couple months or a year or something. And then in theory, you're good if you've got the ability to, you know, have a, psych a psychologist help you with integration and, and of course, address all the other aspects of depression that we know matter, right? So it's not like this is a, a, a single approach therapy, uh, but it's not supposed to be taken every day. It's nowhere close to as toxic as the classical uh, antidepressants. Uh, which have to be taken every day and over the long term you know they can sensitize you to to depression if this is not like the diminishing returns actually flip you know at some point and that's not the case with psilocybin so 
even if I think that result of that trial where the primary outcome is, is not that different, um, to me, it actually doesn't matter that much because the uh, actual depression scale that they use isn't particularly better than the secondary outcome that was different. So there's that. And then there's all the other aspects that improved like avoidance, anhedonia, work and social function, flourishing, well-being, um, su even suicidality very ever so slightly. So, you know, I, I see these as long-term treatments. Um, um, I mean, with, with benefits that will accrue mostly over the long term, because it's not something that's going to be like a light switch. You can have it in the acute phase with like ketamine, for example, if you have a intravenous ketamine or you snort ketamine, you know, in the doctor's office, which I think is with <laughs> intravenous in this case, not snorting it, but you can get some total immediate relief of your depression, but it's just not going to last. And I think right. with psilocybin, and, you have, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it seems like this is having the potential for, okay, let's combine this and this, this for the short term, this for the long term, this yeah. for maintaining, all this type of stuff. And more tools, especially if they work and potentially have benefit, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Like, good, more options for people. I definitely want right. more options for people. I don't think keto is going to be the only option for people with yeah. depression and mood disorders. I don't think psilocybin is. I don't think medication is. I don't think therapy is. Some people are going to take a handful yeah. of those. Some are only going to need one. Some are going to find something completely different. Like, well, I just did this thing and yeah. then it was fixed at the end. And yeah. all of that is working more towards people not being depressed anymore, which is good. <laughs> right. And, you know, it's, although I'm very critical of antidepressants and psych psychiatrists who resort to them a lot, I totally get it. If you're, if you're, especially if you're desperate and you, mm -hmm. we, we have shitty options, like make no mistake. I I'm with you there. You have shitty options. So if you end up taking a citalopram or whatever else, like it's no judgment. I'm just saying it's not a good option. There's, there are other options. Think about it carefully. That's the, that's the message. I'm not like an anti, Oh, if it's th synthetic, it's not good or anything. I, really don't give a shit in that yeah. in that sense you know pretty just much just options. make make the information available try and find yeah. better and better options and then let people yeah. pick and figure out what works best for them it's going to be different for different people depending on yeah. the source depending on who knows what other many factors and again just like with diet it's going to be trial and error if something doesn't work it's not your fault just try the next thing work with someone until you find what finally does and then yeah. rejoice and enjoy right. life yeah. So we really need to open a clinic where you can go uh, for some uh, barbecue and be given a nice uh, uh, bong maybe and have a massage table and then be able to do some whatever yoga or something. We need to set up a clinic that can do that for everyone, Shaban. I think that's the that's what I'm getting from our conversation. Yeah. If I'm reading Just you correctly. Present all the options <laughs> properly supervised right. and then... Yeah. Just honestly, that sounds like an awesome vacation in general, just for anyone, <laughs> right. even if you're not depressed, like if you yeah. open that up, I'll, I'll come hang out for a while. Yeah. If, if I ever, if I ever become a super billionaire, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be, yeah, just taking over land like Bill Gates is with the farmland, but I'll just be having tons of clinics for people to come eat good food and, and feel better about themselves, be less depressed. <laughs> yeah. That sounds awesome. Honestly. Yeah. Like genuinely, that sounds like it could be helpful for people. Like we're just going to give yeah. you this awesome environment. You can just stay here for a while, see how you feel at the end, and then pick whatever options you think are working best and go from there. Like just right. set them up to succeed from the very start. Yeah. All right. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Thanks for taking the time. Um, please tell everyone where they can find you and, and any experiments you're, you're about to, to launch into. Yeah, so I post my experiment updates on cholesterolcode.com. Uh, you can also mostly find me on Twitter at Siobhan underscore Huggins. I hope you'll have that in the show notes so people don't have to try and yeah. spell it because it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's pretty much where I hang out. I'm also on Facebook and stuff like that, but I'm mostly on Twitter, hanging out and messing around mostly. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. That's how we learn. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Shaban. And I'll catch you guys soon. Oh, and subscribe to my Substack. 
definitely subscribe to my Sustack. I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, mushrooms and antidepressants and some really cool, oh, epigenetics and some uh, cool stuff to come with regards to protein and, and energy and all that stuff we've talked about. So subscribe, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep, I will. Bye.